Well, good morning. God's peace to you. It's great to be with you this morning, and we pray that you're blessed for being here in this place. We are beginning a series of studies in the book of Revelation, but fear not, we're going to stop before we get to chapter 4. Yeah, chapter 4 and forward is where all the good stuff happens, I know. But uh, we're going to look at the first three chapters in this study of the seven churches of Asia, which I believe if you understand these first three chapters, you'll have a better shot of understanding the rest of the book, which we may get to at some point. The book of Revelation is often met with trepidation and sometimes shock and horror at the images, the awesome visions of beasts, dragons, and lions, the woman, the great serpent, and so on and so forth. The word revelation is from the Greek word Apocalypto, which gives us our English word apocalypse. I'm not talking about a Martin Scorsese film. I'm talking about a genre of literature, a form of writing that was very popular at the time that John writes the book of Revelation during that first century period. The word simply means an unveiling or revealing of that which is hidden. And so it carries the idea that what is made known by revelation is something that would not otherwise be knowable without it. Now, there are a lot of things we can know without special revelation from God, without visions being sent to John to to report to us in the book. We can know that God exists. We can know that he is not part of the creation. This is what Paul talks about when he writes to the Romans and Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where he says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky, or the creation, and through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible attributes. Now, how can you see what's invisible? Well, Paul means you look at the creation, you look at the earth, you look at the sky, and you can discern from those things A few things about God, at least. Not everything, but a few things. What can you discern? Well, you can know that if there's a creation, there must be a creator. So that he exists is something we can know. And it's a reason why Paul would say that the Romans, and like all of us, are without excuse. Because you can know that God exists. You can also know that God is eternal. He's timeless, that he's not bound by time like we are in this earth-time-space continuum. We can also know that a creator who could create what we see around us must be extraordinarily powerful. And Paul says you can know his divine nature, which is to say you can know that God is uncreated, apart from the created natural world. He's not Divine. He's not natural, he's divine. He's otherworldly. You can know all these things, Paul says, just by observing the creation around you. And so today, there are a lot of people who are seeking after the creator, the, the eternal, the powerful, the divine creator. They may be seeking him through world religions. They may be seeking him through their own pursuits of of enlightenment or philosophy. But we know since Christ came into the world, the only way to truly know God and to know eternal life is through the Son. And so while you can know some things about God and we're all going to be accountable as creatures to our Creator and we won't have any excuse, we won't be able to say to God, well, you know, I didn't know there was going to be any account that I'd have to make because we can know that God exists that he is our creator. But there are a lot of things we wouldn't know if God didn't choose to reveal them to us. And obviously, the the greatest revelation of God is in his son, Jesus, who came to earth in the form of a man and lived and died and rose the third day and, and showed us who God is. At one point, one of Jesus' disciples, Philip, said, Are you going to now show us the Father, Lord? And Jesus says, have I been with you so long? And you say you still don't know the Father? In other words, 
If you've been with me, then you would know who the Father is. Well, that's the kind of revelation that we wouldn't have except for God sending his son, except for God revealing his special revelation to us in his word. And here in the book of Revelation, what's being unveiled, what's being revealed is that hidden plan of God that is at work and is continuing to work and will finally be consummated at the end of all things. What kind <clears throat> what kind of revelation is provided in this book? Well, in the first two verses of chapter 1, we find that revelation is presented to John as visions. Let's go ahead and read there in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. Excuse me, must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to take a little moment and notice verse 1. Because in verse 1, here in the New Living Translation, many modern translation, it simply says uh, the angel made known or the angel presented the revelation. But the American Standard Version gets it added a little bit better where it says, more literally, I suppose, uh, in Revelation 1, verse 1, he sent and signified it by his angel unto her, his servant John. Now, that word signified is a word that's otherwise translated presented or made known. But if you actually look up the meaning of that word, that Greek word, semion, semion, it means to make known by signs. And if you read the rest of the book of Revelation, you can see why that word is used to describe what John saw. Because the angel made it known to him through visions which serve as signs to us. Now, to say that the book of Revelation is a book of visions and signs means that we must read it differently than we might read any other books of the Bible. The apocalyptic kind of literature we find in the book of Revelation wasn't unique, but it, it, it's found in other writings of the first century period and several Jewish writings at the time that had this kind of hidden symbolic meaning attached to it. The book of Revelation, though, is not just for reading. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. For the time is near. This book is meant for us to read and respond to. It's not just meant for reading. It's not just for folks who are curious of the speculative nature of end times theories. That's not what this book is about. It's really about responding in faithful obedience to the message of this book. Now, how do you respond? How do you obey signs? How do we respond to visions? Well, as we'll see, the book of Revelation sends a strong message to the church of the first century, as well as the church today, a message which calls us to faithfulness and perseverance through trials and tribulations and suffering for the cause of Christ. The historical context is very important to understand what we read here in this book. The Christians enjoyed a relationship with uh, the Jewish world early on. As far as the Roman Empire was concerned, Christianity was just another sect of Judaism until AD 64, when there was a great fire in the city of Rome. The emperor at that time, Nero, had been traveling. He was on vacation. He comes back to see the city burning and also to see everybody blaming him. That's what happens when you're in charge and you're not around when bad stuff happens. You get blamed for it. And Nero's looking around for somebody else to throw the blame on. 
and the Christians are there already kind of causing trouble in a couple different ways. And he sees how to kill two birds with one stone. I'll deal with those troublemaking Christians and I will get the blame off of me. And he blamed the Christians for the fire, for starting the fire, which probably was accidental. Nobody really knows what started the fire, but Nero blamed it on Christians and began persecuting Christians as a distinct religious group. Well, Nero came and went, and there were a few other emperors between Nero and Domitian. And Domitian is the emperor at the time of John's writing. And Domitian took Nero's persecution and cranked it up big time and sent it all throughout the Roman Empire. So no matter where you were, you didn't have to be in Rome now. You could be in Asia Minor, what we consider modern-day Turkey today. You could be a church in that part of the world, and you would experience the persecution of the Roman Empire. What was going on then helps us apply the book of Revelation to what may be going on today. But we must be careful not to assume that everything described in the book of Revelation has a modern day equivalent. Much like the parables of Jesus that teach principles of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation teaches us principles of faithfulness in the great spiritual battle between the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the light, versus the kingdoms of this world and the prince of darkness. Well, today, just by way of introduction, we're not going to get into any of the churches per se, but we're going to look a little closer at this book that's going to present a message to these churches, which is also a message for us today. So let's go back to chapter one, and we're going to read through the chapter together, beginning now in verse four. Revelation one, verse four says, this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is to come from the sevenfold spirit before the throne and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. Now, this is a Trinitarian formula that you find in other places in the scripture where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all mentioned together. And here, everything looks pretty standard. You have uh, him who is and who always was. That's pointing you back to the name of God that Moses was given, right? The great I am, the ever-present, he who is and who always was and who always will be, right? God the Father. But then you also have Jesus Christ mentioned. And then finally, you have the Holy Spirit. You say, wait a minute, where's the Holy Spirit in here? It doesn't say that. It says the sevenfold spirit, or your translation may simply say the seven spirits before the throne. We get a little inkling of what's going on in the book of Revelation when it comes to numbers right away. The number seven is very important. And throughout the book of Revelation, really throughout the whole Bible, anytime the number seven is used, it is clearly the number for perfection or completion. How often do you forgive your brother? Seven times a day? No, seven times 70. Not a literal number, obviously. <laughs> if you're counting, you've missed the point but it's to be perfect or complete in our forgiveness. That's the way the number is here. So the Holy Spirit is the complete, the perfect Holy One before the throne. Uh, we continue on there in verse 5. And all glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. So you see, again, this Trinitarian formula, and you're going to see the role of Jesus throughout the book of Revelation as the uh, prophet, priest, and king that fulfills all the promises of God throughout the Old Testament and, of course, is revealed in the New Testament in the gospel message. Verse 6, he has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. 
All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Now this again is pointing us back to what what God had done under that old covenant system by creating Israel as a kingdom and nation of priests. How they would serve in this unique role to, to present God to the world. And what does the church do today? They fulfill that role of, of priestly service, of being an intermediary between God and the world, bringing the good news that people might enter into fellowship with the Son. And the verse 7 says, Look, behold, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. All the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. You're going to notice that the visions that John reports, he reports them as somebody who is making a, a proclamation or an announcement. And his his tone, his fervor in describing these images, these visions, is a response to the visions and images himself being overcome by the majesty of the Lord who comes with the clouds of heaven. And what does he say? Verse 8, the Lord says, look, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. College is starting but I guarantee you this is not about pledging to a fraternity. Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end. The alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. The alpha and the omega. You get the beginning and the end. Now, who is he? The one who is who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. Now, as we see the rest of the book of Revelation, we're going to learn through those three things. We're going to learn what is, right? What we're going to learn is what always, always was, and what yet is still to come. If we read the book of Revelation through those uh, three levels, what is, what has always been, and what is sure to come, then we will really understand the visions that John reports to us. Verse 9, John says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering in God's kingdom and in the patience, uh, patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. So John describes some of the persecution that the church is experiencing by reporting his own persecution, how he's been exiled to this island. And rather than seeing that as a defeat, John says, actually, I'm here to preach. Now, I don't know about you, being in exile on an island doesn't seem like the best missionary strategy. But John is not dismayed by that. And as it turns out, while he's there, he writes this, this book that we're reading today, that the whole world has been reading for some 2,000 years. He indeed preached from the Isle of Patmos preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. He says, it was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches that receive letters from the Lord. Now, I don't think these are the only churches. I don't think there were only seven churches. Again, that seven is a symbolic number. It shows us completion. It isn't there weren't any churches. In fact, we know there were other churches. There was a church at Colossae that's not mentioned here. And yet it's in the same region. So it's not all the churches of Asia, it's just these seven. And these seven are either chosen because they're representative, or they're even symbolically devised to be representative. 
Scholars debate whether they're uh, actually uh, representative of uh, literal churches or rather they're just used as a device to talk about the church in its fullness throughout all the ages. Either way, it doesn't really matter. We can take it either way and we get the message. Verse 12, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the son of man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand. And a sharp two-edged sword came out from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Now, I've read Bible commentators who will introduce the book of Revelation. They'll admit that it's a book of signs and visions. And then right here, the first major vision that's reported, they'll say, you know, this is probably how Jesus is going to look when we see him. Well, maybe, maybe. Do you think he's going to have a sword coming out of his mouth when you see him? I don't know, maybe. Maybe. Are we missing the point if that's our conclusion, that this is a description of the actual appearance of Jesus in eternal life? Maybe it is, but if that's all we draw from this reading of John's vision, we have not actually understood, and then we are not going to be able to respond and obey the signs in the book. Well, John continues, verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so right here in chapter one, we get another clue about how to read this book. Now, it's not always going to be case. In fact, very rarely does the book of Revelation explain the meaning of the vision. But here you have an explanation. This is the meaning of the vision of the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands. And what is it? Well, the stars are the angels of the, ch the seven churches, and the gold lampstands are the seven churches. There are places in the book of Revelation where it is said the dragon is Satan. <laughs> Just flat out says it. You don't have to scratch your head and go, what is that symbolic of? But that's rare. Most of the time, the reader is expected to understand what the visions represent. Now, how can we do that? Well, if we are immersed in the literature of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and the gospel preaching of the kingdom in, in Jesus' teaching, then we are going to recognize those signs. For example, where do we see a golden lampstand? Well, you see it in the temple, don't you? You see a golden lampstand with seven candles in the temple of the old covenant tabernacle system. And there you have this one lampstand. They're all tied together in one lampstand because when you went to worship God, where did you go? One place. And there the light would be shining out from that one location. But like Jesus talked with the Samaritan woman and explained to her that now God only seeks worshipers who worship in spirit and truth, not worshipers that worship in this mountain or in Jerusalem, wherever location you may be. So here we are in Amity, Oregon, and there are churches all over the world that are lampstands, that have their own lampstand, and they shine the light. Just like the golden lampstand in the tabernacle 
illuminated the holy place. When people see the church today, and I don't just mean when we're gathered together, when the, the world sees us, those who meet here in this place, in Amity, Oregon, in our community, and they see us out at the ball game, and they see us at our places of work, and they see us in the schools or in the grocery store, they see us driving, yeah, even driving, when they see us, they need to see the light of the kingdom shining. Just like you would see the light from the golden lampstand when you enter the holy place of God in the tabernacle. Today, these clues in chapter 1 help us to read the rest of the book. As you continue to read, you learn more and more and you are able to understand more and more. The vision of the Son of Man, the vision of Jesus, is made known by signs. And what did John see? Well, he saw a glorious image, a powerful image, an image that demanded respect and honor, the image of a king. John was told to write down everything he saw. The old Southern Gospel song says, John saw jasper walls. Oh my, oh my, what a vision. John told of shining streets of gold where all God's saints shall forever stroll. I've wondered time and again, how could it have been to gaze upon that heavenly throne? But I'll wonder no more when I step on that shore to walk upon the golden ground that John saw. We're reading pictures. And those pictures present to us truths about what is, what has always been, and what is surely to come. Now already, we've seen that images and numbers are used symbolically and not literally. The churches are not literally seven gold lampstands, and there were more than seven churches in Asia. These churches are, however, symbolic of the church then and the church now, and the church always. So what, whatever the case may be, we learn some very specific things from these letters to the seven churches of Asia. Number one, we learn that the church is intended to be the light of the world, just as Jesus said. He claimed to be the light of the world, and he told his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill. Paul must have picked up on that teaching because he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. And he said, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. There's a lot of crooked and perversity going on in the world today. And as Christians, sometimes we get the idea that the way we're going to live is we're going to just get as close as we can to the world without crossing that line, right? We're just going to walk as close as we can. And Paul says, no, you're called to be light in darkness. So how do you do that? Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Maybe instead of trying to get as close to the world as we can, we need to try to be as close to Jesus as we can so that we shine his light to the world. The church should continue to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ through its testimony, through its gospel preaching and through its example. And if it doesn't, well, each church is going to learn, as we'll see in this series, what is and what is to come. The Lord diagnoses the situation in each church, and he calls them to either repent or to maintain their faithfulness in the midst of suffering. 
If the church heeds the Lord's command, then they will persevere until he comes. They will overcome. They will be victorious. And really, chapter 4 and forward is all about the victory that Jesus is going to bring. But first he says to the churches of Asia, hang on, be faithful, go back, repent, do the works that I've called you to do. If the church fails to heed the Lord's command, then he will, he says, remove their lampstand. In other words, that church will fail. Now, certainly, the warnings to the churches are grave. And I want to be clear as we go through this study that these are warnings about the, the existence of a church or the, the uh, demise of a church. It isn't necessarily describing the salvation of every member of that church. There's certainly members of the church of Ephesus, even the church of Thyatira, as bad as they were, that were faithful. That hadn't bowed the knee to Baal, in other words. And there's always going to be faithful people in bad churches. It's always going to be that. There's going to be people who are trying to live faithfully. But if a church doesn't, as a whole, do the works that Christ has called them to do, their lampstand will be removed because you don't need a lampstand unless you're shining the light. A lot of churches are falling apart these days. And I can't imagine it is anything less than the Lord removing their lampstand. The truth is that churches come and churches go. Some last for many, many years. This church was established in 1846. That's a long time ago for the West Coast. If you go to the East Coast, there's churches that have been there since the 1700s. And if you go to Europe, there's churches that have been there for a thousand years. When I was in England a while back, a few years ago, uh, in Cambridge, the oldest church in Cambridge is still there, at least a restoration of it. It's a Norman church. It was like 1,500 years old. Some churches come, some churches go. What matters is that the light shines. And when Jesus said he would build his church, what did he say? He said, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So you know what? If the church here at Amity decides not to do the works we're called to do, that ain't going to stop the Lord's church. It may stop this church. But the church will continue. The universal church will never be overcome. In fact, the Lord will help us to overcome and have the victory. We may learn from a study of the seven churches of Asia, the common pitfalls that churches fall into, and we can learn how to overcome them and find favor with the Lord. But I would also say it's not just a message to the church collectively, but to each one of us as members of a local church. What we read in these letters to the seven churches are admonitions exhortations, warnings, calls to repentance, calls to faithfulness for each one of us. Because while the church is a collective thing, it's something we do together, we can't do it without each one of us. If you think about church as candlesticks or golden lampstands with candles on them, you know, if you have one candle in a pitch black dark room, that's going to illuminate that room and give you a little light, but it's still not going to be well lit. But what if you have two or three candles or four candles or maybe a hundred candles in that room or a thousand candles? Pretty soon the light in that room is going to be so bright. Each one of us is a part of shining the light in our local church and when it's only one or two that are heeding the call of Christ in a local church, 
that light isn't as bright as it could be. And so it's a message to the church, but it's a message to members of the local church as well. Every time Jesus ends his message to these churches, he says that he has the keys, he opens the door, he has the power, the ability to help us have the victory. And again, chapters 4 and onward tell the story of that, that victory. But that's a promise he holds out to us. So maybe this morning you're experiencing a struggle in your faith. Or maybe you're feeling just weighed down with the challenges of life. And trying to be faithful isn't as easy as it, as it could be today because of those challenges you're facing. Hear the message of the letters to the seven churches of Asia. To him who overcomes, I will give you life. Be faithful. Trust him who helps us to overcome, helps us to have the victory. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the king of all the rulers of the world. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Help us to see his majesty, his glory, and the visions that John saw and reports to us in this book. And help us to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches in these letters. That we might read, and not just read, but respond and obey to the signs in this book. That we might overcome and have the victory in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.